April 14th, Bradley Lynch, a, a young practitioner out of Chicago, and that'll be a 4 p.m. lecture on a Wednesday. And then the last will be April 19th, that's a Monday, 8 p.m. lecture, just like tonight, and that's with Architectonica from Miami, Florida. So we, we still have a lot of excitement left in our guest lecture series, so again, keep the energy up and keep coming to see what we can bring to you all. Additionally, I'd like to uh, have two thank yous. First and foremost, um, Jonathan Spodek, who has been the faculty host for Hugh Miller tonight's guest lecture. And so thank you, Jonathan, for taking on that task and, and uh, helping to welcome Hugh into our community. That's a really important part that our faculty hosts play. The second thank you is to the students of the Historic Preservation Department. Um, basically, they have sponsored a reception which will be immediately after the lecture tonight. So uh, thank you for in advance for hosting that event. And tied with that, I also would encourage you all to go to the gallery. There's a great exhibit that just opened up. And it's uh, about the design of the civic waterfront for Indianapolis area. And you'll see about six notable uh, architects, landscape architects, um, people who have contributed to developing Indianapolis's waterfront. And, and it's a really very handsome exhibit. So after the lecture, um, when you're you know, uh, eating a little and, and drinking a little coffee, please wander through our gallery to see what we have there. All right, so at this point in time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jim Glass, the Director of the Historic Preservation Program, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. I didn't really expect nor need any applause for coming up to do an introduction. Um, before I begin my introduction, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our guest uh, from the community, uh, Ball State community, Muncie community, and region outside Ball State. We appreciate your participation in tonight's program. And as Pam said, I also want to urge you to sample the tempting reception that has been prepared for us by the Associated Students of Historic Preservation following the lecture. Twenty years ago, the late David Hermanson and his colleagues in the Department and College of Architecture and Planning, founded a Master of Science degree in Historic Preservation here at Ball State. The purpose of the degree was to provide graduate training for people from varied undergraduate backgrounds in the new professional field of historic preservation. Today, the master's degree has educated over 70 persons, most of whom have gone into preservation careers with government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and consulting firms. With tonight's lecture, we begin our 20th anniversary celebration for the preservation program, a celebration that will continue throughout the rest of 1999 and reach its culmination with a series of events during the fall semester on the actual anniversary of the founding. We will be notifying the university and historic preservation communities of these special events this summer and early next fall and hope that many of you can come. To inaugurate our celebration, we are very fortunate to have as our college guest lecturer tonight a distinguished leader in the historic preservation field, Hugh C. Miller, FAIA. Hugh is an internationally recognized authority on the appropriate care, conservation, restoration, and rehabilitation of historic resources. During a 28-year career with the National Park Service, he helped develop guidelines for the maintenance and restoration of historic monuments and parks in the national park system and led the planning projects for the preservation of the Chicago Sky School skyscrapers and for the Pennsylvania Avenue corridor in Washington, D.C. From 1979 to 1988, Mr. Miller served as chief historical architect of the National Park Service and as such served as the principal professional advisor for the care of historic architecture within the Park Service properties. Also as chief historical architect, he served as executive architect for the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island restoration projects during the 1980s. He also developed training courses for historical architects within the Park Service on preservation technology and served as a pioneer in advocating the preservation of cultural landscapes in the United States. 
After leaving the National Park Service, Mr. Miller was appointed founding director of the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, which serves as the Virginia State Historic Preservation Office, and established a cabinet-level agency in Virginia that successfully advocated preservation of historic properties and archaeological sites throughout the Old Dominion. He has been active for many years in the American Institute of Architects, serving as the chair of the National Historic Resources Committee, which is the principal historic preservation arm of the AIA, and has been a key figure in the Association for Preservation Technology, uh, which is the National Association of, preservation, prof, of Professionals involved in the care of historic structures. In addition, his broad interests have led him to involvement in international conservation, and he has served as an advisor on preservation and restoration projects in Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, Greece, Iran, India, Singapore, Macau, Mexico, and England. He also is a teacher and author, and he is currently serving as an adjunct professor in preservation technology at Goucher College, and is general editor and author of the lead essay in a forthcoming book, Caring for Your Historic House, coming to us from Abrams soon. I think you'll agree that we couldn't have anyone better to speak on tonight's subject than Hugh Miller, who will speak to us on the topic Architectural Conservation Comes of Age, 1970s to 1990s, One View of the Art and Science of Historic Preservation. Will you please wel join me in welcoming Hugh Miller. You. what that uh, means and uh, what's in it for architects, uh, planners, landscape architects, and uh, the uh, preservation community uh, at large. Uh, for some people, architectural conservation is thought of as an art of a science of putting fragments of paint, plaster, masonry back together. Uh, I think it is more. I think that uh, conservation is a philosophy. It's made up of programs. It's a science. And I believe that one takes this holistic aspect of Of 
programs where local preservation organizations could be involved in that program known as the Certified Local Governments. And the third part of that uh, federal legislation was the establishment of the advisory, President's Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and the Section 106 of the Act, which required that federal agencies undertaking projects that may impact uh, historic resources would provide an opportunity for comment. And that has become a very powerful tool in commenting on federal undertakings. I think that as one looks at this background and realize what was happening in the uh, uh, world of preservation, that there was a new way to look at buildings. There also was a emerging interest to give some focus to this concept of uh, conservation. And I think one of the thresholds that I look at, certainly was important to me, was in, the, in 1972, there was an international conference called Preservation and Conservation that brought together practitioners uh, in the private sector and the government sector uh, in preservation with museum conservators and started to talk about the ideas of dealing with the fabric and the function of buildings as a science. This was an important step because prior to that point in America there was a preoccupation of with agencies and uh, private uh, preservation organizations with reconstruction, building something that was long gone. There was the Southern Ironworks in New England, uh, Fort Stanley, Bensel, uh, uh, Fort, you name it. There was a preoccupation with spending a lot of money on building something that was long gone. There was a lot of, of time and effort dealing with taking interesting buildings that had associations with events or people and stripping away their architectural character to recreate the period of the place. That first slide is the Andrew Johnson home before it was restored by the Park Service. And here we see what it looked like when Mr. Johnson lived there. And I think it's a very reasonable question about is this preservation? And what have we gained and what have we lost when we look at this question of do we keep it all? I think a lot of the questions that were being asked in this aspect of is restoration stripping away uh, the changes over time? Is uh, reconstruction valid preservation? And should we keep it all? Might be best uh, looked at as we think about uh, what was happening in New England. I think a lot of credit should go to the Society for Preservation of New England Antiquities, SPLEA, particularly to its associate director, uh, George Mann, who said, we should keep all our buildings. And they had a vast collection of buildings owned by uh, the society throughout New England. Uh, keep them as they are. And that question was then uh, raised when the Park Service acquired the wayside a uh, colonial house that was part of the battle road uh, between Lexington and Concord. And yes, there is a colonial house there. But to restore it to a colonial period would mean stripping away all these elements. Unfortunately, this house had recognizable owners. Uh, the Thaniel Orthon built this think tank. Uh, the Alcott Sisters uh, put on this ring in the bay. Uh, a publisher whose wife wrote Please all how that grew uh, put on this uh, uh, porch. And so we had a house uh, that grew, a colonial house, a house that we know was occupied by one minute, but also occupied over time with other people. And the decision was made to keep it all. And this idea of preservation of all started to come into focus to, uh, to save a place. At the same time, I was, uh, became active in the uh, park system and we're looking at the case, why are we really storing buildings that even in my earlier career, uh, 15 years or earlier, had been restored? And started working in a training program with park professionals and particularly with park makers and came up with uh, the slogan, 
Uh, actually, I had a T-shirt I used to uh, end my uh, uh, session by taking off my coat and tie and saying, if you're going to do it, let's be Superman and say that uh, maintenance is preservation. Uh, and starting that idea, the National Register of Preservation Technology program picked up that idea and published their first uh, publications on maintenance of historic structures. Uh, we need to think about maintenance as uh, not being uh, a trade activity, that it is, in fact, bringing together the skills and decision making of science and the fact that the hand teaches the mind. And I think at that moment I have the, the great opportunity of running into Sir Bernard Field and uh, the guru of architectural uh, conservation in England, uh, who was in the United States uh, on a conference and had him come to uh, one of my workshops to meet these people. We talked about the importance of the hand teaching the mind uh, and the importance of past people being involved in decision making on historic structures. I think that then one of the fortunate aspects to take these ideas and put them out into the public sector was the passing of the uh, Tax Rehabilitation Act in 1976. And all of a sudden, this idea of rehabilitating, not restoring, but rehabilitating buildings to meet the secretary's standards was something that made good sense economically, it made good sense for investors. And those uh, 21 intervening years since then, there's been over 27 million, 300 million dollars invested, private sector investment into, uh, excuse me, I'm reading this number. It's 19 billion, 19.5 billion and 27,000 uh, projects. But we're still talking about a big number. 19 billion dollars that has revitalized important structures, whether they're railroad stations in Kansas City, the back of the road in Richmond, uh, terrace houses in small towns that are investment properties. And I think that this rehabilitation started to make a lot of things possible in America that up to that point was hard to sell. The ideas of revitalizing towns. Well, back to the city movement in the early 70s, mid 70s, it was very exciting to see people moving back into Portland, to uh, St. Louis, uh, into the city core, revitalizing individual townhouses or terraces of houses uh, for their own use. And investors uh, buying these properties, uh, subdividing them into uh, departments that still meet the secretary's standards, and making investments in the center city. Uh, this then caught on with what is rightfully referred to in Europe as urban conservation where there were major efforts to revitalize, often with developers. Uh, Quincy Market in Boston, uh, the Ross uh, put together uh, their marketing skills, uh, utilizing existing buildings, uh, dealing with additions, and really made these centers of old city people places, destination places, dynamic places, utilizing old buildings. And, from Boston to Philadelphia to, uh, to Portland uh, or Seattle in their uh, pioneer squares. This idea of urban conservation, uh, revitalizing downtown, and it's happened in the big cities and the smaller cities, and pretty dynamic to see that happening. Now, in the early 70s, there were also some ideas that died hard. And the idea of clear-cutting along Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House, which is just off the street, and the Treasury Department uh, is at this point uh, creating a great plaza, a uh, grand plaza, demolishing buildings in this plaza, and demolishing all the buildings on the north side of the street to a great establish a plaza and a great avenue to the Capitol, was an idea that was launched in the uh, 60s, uh, President Kennedy had complained about the happiness of America's main street. He was right. 
uh, Skidmore, Owens, and Mara sold this idea of uh, clear cutting uh, along Pennsylvania Avenue and, and building a monumental avenue uh, of uh, pretty uh, homogeneous buildings. Fortunately, that, I, that project never got presented, and people were seriously starting to question whether this was the way to go. And the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation Act of 1972 was passed, a remarkable piece of planning legislation. If you're interested in planning, look up that Act of Congress, because it provided the mechanism and the will and the organization to not only plan, but to implement the plan. And we all know as planners that the public will implement the plan becomes the hard part. The legislation required that the mayor of the city of Washington and the secretary of the interior would comment on the plan, and I have the privilege of being the senior staff person for Ernest Allen Conley, who was representing the secretary of the interior, as we commented on the plan, and we were able to take a development plan and talk about making a preservation plan. We walked that avenue with Nat Owens and wrestled him about uh, ideas of uh, how this would be developed. And actually, he had fun at the end of Matt's uh, life to have him find old buildings that were exciting architecturally. Uh, we became interesting uh, uh, combatants and very good friends. But in the process of looking at existing buildings as the fabric of the city and the potentials for preservation, more than 15 buildings were saved significant part of the heritage of our nation's main street. And a number of facades, the facades of the guess one maybe, were also assembled uh, in uh, the area around the archives to create an interesting, uh, what that called the Gaslight District. We kept saying, hey, it's not Gaslights, but anyway, that's the point. And the Willard Hotel, which was on the block, to be demolished to create the Grand Plaza was, became an, a major issue of it is not economically viable, it was a big building this time. Uh, it has lime mortars, not going to hold up. And thanks to the National Trust, put some money on the table to hire a consultant to get a second continuum. The building really is a steel frame building. Uh, the lime mortar in the uh, curtain wall brick. Uh, and the foundation is more than sufficient to carry the weight of the masonry. And the potentials for economic viability really could work. And so the Willard became the key point in re-looking at the avenue and looking for ways to uh, preserve uh, the important buildings that had identity along, uh, along the avenue and architectural importance. So from the ideas of preserving the nation's main street, we have gone to the idea of preserving town main streets. And certainly here in Indianapolis, or excuse me, in Indiana, uh, and Madison at the Steinhardt Building, and certainly the Anchor were one of the first three of the model uh, main street programs that uh, were started in 1976. And I think that the success that you can see across Indiana, whether it's uh, Madison or Cornland, of getting people excited about their main street. And the formula of economic development, where you deal with revitalization, you deal with architecture enhancement, you deal with merchants being involved in bringing people into their shops and activities over the shops, uh, have been a very successful program. To some of the older Main Street programs, I know certainly in Virginia, have been successful to carry on because they've been willing to pay for a, a Main Street cheerleader. That program was successful because some excited person got into those towns as the Main Street coordinator and brought together the interested parties of the elected officials, the property owners, the store owners, and the citizens of the town to say, our Main Street is important too. And that is architectural conservation, town conservation at its best. This certainly set the framework for looking at 
conservation of towns, of cities, of neighborhoods as an ideal. And the potential for using one's imagination in adaptive use of historic buildings is limited only by the imagination of the architect and the willingness of the developer and the banker, even where this happens to be uh, Quaker Square in Anchorage, Ohio, uh, Quaker Company, uh, grain storage facilities that were turned into apartment buildings. Probably wouldn't meet the secretary standards, but the potential is for using buildings that are part of the lethal quality of the uh, town and providing a continuing use, of course, is legend, and there are a lot of interesting case studies of taking trolley barns and turning them into malls, and tobacco warehouses and, and uh, textile mills and turning them into apartments, and looking at this aspect of uh, the uh, turning poorhouses, county poorhouses, into hotels. I think that the success of that program, as I've said, $19 billion in 21 years. Last year, last fiscal year, 1989, ending in October, uh, was again one of those high point years. For the first time since 1986, when the uh, Tax Act was changed, so there was not as many credits available, uh, there were over $2. 0.85 billion. I got that number right now. 2.85 billion dollars of investment in 1,036 buildings, projects. That is a lot of work. Some architects had a lot of services, and I think that the potential, as you look at what there is in terms of rehabilitation of our existing stock and recognize even with the Tax Act changes in 1986, it still is an opportunity for investment. There's still an opportunity for preservation professionals and architects, landscape architects, planners to be able to start to work together with developers and owners to talk about rehabilitating their historic property. Uh, there is money saving it for the investors, and there are also are lots of opportunity for design professionals and preservation professionals. Now let me just digress a moment because a lot of other things that were happening that were pretty exciting in this period of 1970, 1990s. Uh, the new archaeology was really discovered, uh, pushed a lot by salvage archaeology, first in the river basin programs and then uh, the mitigation in 106, but it was highway work. But historic archaeology became credible uh, within the profession. Uh, it became something that people started to study and understand. Uh, looking at Native American sites in east of the Mississippi River, uh, looking at uh, historic sites in recent as 10 years prior to uh, the present, uh, looking at questions related to uh, non-destructive testing, uh, predictive modeling, very interesting uh, idea of statistically looking at archaeological sites. Uh, data collection for research purposes uh, really is an expansion of, of the new archaeology and then an awareness that with the archaeological excavation there's a responsibility for collection management, documentation of the perspective of conservation and, and appropriate storage or display. At the same time, it was exciting, it was pretty exciting for me to be involved with the landscape architectural profession because in the period of the 1970s, landscape architects leaped the wall, guard the wall, and really started looking at the countryside, the natural landscape, rural districts as cultural landscapes, and also started to recognize that design garden the eligible for the National Register. In uh, 1978, the, the uh, Preservation Alliance for Historic Landscapes was established in New Harmony, an organization that brings together uh, a multidisciplinary uh, group of people who are interested and concerned with uh, the preservation of landscapes. And if uh, any of you are interested in that organization, C.A. Henderson is an active member 
of the alliance with our food program. There are a lot of things that we need to learn. The United States profession came into federation about 50 years later. It's been catching up. It's been catching up well. But there's still a lot of work to do as we look at this question of how do we preserve landscapes and how do we articulate the values in rural districts when we're talking to the Department of, of Transportation, whether it's VDOT or INDOT or name your favorite uh, transportation department that is now required to consider cultural landscapes as resources that they may impact with their undertaking. And at the same time, I've been a big awareness of traditional cultures and how do we deal with the interests and the, and the uh, caring and, and the understanding of Native Americans, uh, African American, the natives of the islands. Uh, the World Heritage Convention is dealing with that perhaps a little better than we are, but it is a real challenge that we have in recognizing, uh, dealing with uh, Native uh, culture, dealing with sacred places, dealing with cultural interests that are quite different from our European background. Now I think that when we talk about architectural conservation as a practice, and in fact there is a profession of architectural conservators and projects uh, for the government, particularly GSA, look for an architectural conservator on the project team so that there's some questions about what is an architectural conservator, what are they working towards, and I think the principle of architectural conservation can be broadly applied to the entire profession of preservation and not just to scientists. Uh, certainly when one talks about looking at a museum piece, a conservator is interested in what was the, art, the artist's intent, uh, what uh, is the meaning and the techniques of the painting, what is its condition, and what scientific tests or principle might be used to conserve uh, or repair uh, a painting or another object. And I think that to some extent we can think of our buildings as objects. And we certainly can discuss the designers or the artist's intent, the owner's intent, or is a design element. Uh, but unlike a not museum object, a building is outside, a building is fixed in its place. A building has certain functional expectations beyond the artistic characteristics of an object of art. So that one has to look at the questions of use and function, and those viability questions, the whole aspect of dealing with regulations and codes and environmental questions and access are quite another dimension. But this question of looking at the building as a work of art to be conserved, I think there are some parallels in the way we think about uh, our buildings. Early in the 1970s, Morgan Phillips, who was then the architectural conservator of the Society of uh, New England uh, Antiquities, uh, came up with an article on principles of preservation that I think were, were worth thinking about. They certainly influenced the first drafts and the secretary's standards. And they're simple enough to really talk about. Uh, the, there are five principles. We've already talked about the first one. Keep it all. This is a Cape Cod house. It's on Cape Cod. It also has a big Cape Cod house and body in that structure. But what a marvelous statement of, of evolution of time and, and characteristics and family needs and so forth. So you can say, what do you gain if you restore this to a colonial Cape Cod house? Isn't it better to keep it all? So again, the first principle is try to keep it all. That's a programmatic question, a practical question, but one that should be easy to talk about. The second question is make sure that the treatment fits physically and historically. There's a, a tendency, certainly as people try to mother goose, as Green Nelson and my colleagues used to say, their property, create buildings that never work. And this is a classic case of taking a farmhouse that's of the same period as that, those are covered in the doorway, but it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit physically, 
it doesn't get distorted. So that being able to understand what your building is, what your building wants to be, and being honest to it becomes principle number two. I think it's important to recognize craftsmanship, uh, to recognize the patina of age, to be willing to accept that something may look a little ratty. Uh, this weatherboard certainly is worn, uh, but it is an original piece from the colonial period of the ribbon and plain, and there has been a bead shot on the edge uh, of the weatherboard to the corner. Uh, certainly it's ratty, uh, but it works. And that question of is it working is another principle that we'll say about the context. So that the opportunity is to recognize the original material, to make sure that it works without making it better, without replacing it, becomes an important part of this principle of number three. Number four is uh, recognize the ghosts of the past. Recognize that the building may be able to tell a story and even if you're not going to restore it to an earlier period, document or preserve these elements. Uh, if you look carefully, you can see the ghost of an earlier porch that was on this building. That's a document. If you're going to be true to preserve it as it is, uh, then even this door place in place uh, is appropriate. But documenting this molding in this relationship we're actually maybe covering it up uh, with some material uh, so that it's protected uh, is, a, is an option. So recognizing the notes of the past, the information of the past, and making sure that it's not lost in the preservation program becomes uh, principle number four. Use traditional materials and craftsmanship if all possible. That argument that you hear and still hear that you can't get it anymore and nobody makes it is not true for handmade materials. There are plenty of craftsmen, uh, plenty of opportunities to get materials. And if you look at the old house journal or traditional building and realize there are a lot of material suppliers, a lot of people that have custom made things. Uh, a lot of manufactured things of the turn of the century are available as appropriate practice. So trying to use original techniques of manufacturing or handmade uh, items, use original materials, uh, is an important part of the conservation principles. And then, only then, when materials are not available or original materials have inherent vice and fail, do you consider perhaps a substitute material. And that's the case here on the same Pacifica Mint. A, a project that probably precipitated the executive order in 19, uh, early 1970s, 11593, that Nixon signed, requiring federal agency to take care of their historic properties. He said, by the way, folks, the provisions of the 1966 Act applies to new federal agencies, too. And the GSA, the Treasury Department, were in the process of trying to make the attempts to make so unattractive that could be torn down by chiseling off the stone cornice. Replacing the stone cornice was not physically or financially Viable. And so the decision was to make a replacement point in use of the glass, uh, supported on uh, stainless steel uh, armature. So designing materials to substitute for original materials is an option when you look at the question can the traditional material or craftsmanship be used? And I think the substitute materials are viable if the number of questions that are met. And there's a good preservation brief on the uh, question of what, what are the issues involved in uh, substitute materials. 
So with this background of preserving buildings instead of restoring them, of adopting the idea of using science, uh, the strip search that used to be done in taking off all the surfaces of historic buildings to see what's underneath the plaster, underneath the floor, was out of the question. It was now possible to use x-ray to investigate what is behind the wall, or what are nailing patterns, where have there been uh, framing for openings. And so the concept of non-destructive or limited engagers uh, considerations were, uh, became important. And we start to look at ways that we can use science to give us certain information about buildings. Uh, we need to be able to design scientific process to answer particular questions rather than strip out all the buildings to see if we can find an answer. That it's important to be able to define, are we playing the dating game where we're trying to date the building? Uh, what kinds of answers might we expect? Are we looking for conditions or problems or solutions to uh, solve a particular problem with the fabric of the building? And we have developed some techniques to be able to look at buildings with feeling and with knowledge about how we think about them. Now again, we learned a lot from museum conservators. We looked a lot at their techniques for diagnosis or analysis of condition and treatment. But unfortunately, one cannot put a building into a cleaning case, as uh, you might with an object, that you're dealing with an entirely different scale uh, in terms of uh, the building, that we need to uh, look at a uh, we need to be looking at uh, non-destructive testing, uh, non-invasive testing, the idea of remote sensing, whether uh, we're dealing with infrared. I don't think we're using infrared as much as we might. But a lot of interest in the uh, energy crunch in the 70s for investigating buildings uh, for heat, but we also investigate buildings for moisture uh, with infrared. Uh, photography or sensing. Uh, applying a surface tape uh, to the surface of the material, taking the impression that you can then take into the microscopy lab uh, to investigate is certainly non-destructive testing at its best. We can look at small samples of paint and compare comparative layers to what might call chronochronology, where you can look at what are the layers and the colors within those layers and uh, not only find the earliest layers, but find out if some of the layers, because of an absence of uh, this orange color, are probably later. Uh, what are the sequences of colors uh, in the same room, different parts of the building? We can uh, certainly, uh, in some cases, use intrusive testing to take samples for the structural purposes measure motion. I would prefer that they take a coin block out before they drill uh, the hole and then replace the coin uh, rather than drill the hole through. But it, there are cases where intrusive testing still is limited and still may provide uh, information. The ability to monitor conditions over the time becomes important, whether it's measuring movements of cracks or whether we're looking at uh, humidity uh, moisture. The ability to measure conditions over time is an important aspect of, uh, of our activities. And now if we can take sensors like this and put them on the data loggers, have computers that can punch those uh, that numbers to uh, measure important things that we want to see. And there are some very interesting computer programs that can monitor uh, moisture and humidity and temperature within a building and crunch that data so we can get an understanding of how that building works in a, in a uh, diurnal cycle, 24 hour cycle, or through the seasons and look at uh, impacts of temperature and humidity on the building. 
There may be situations where we need to do long-term testing. Certainly, in the interest of the acid rain programs in the 80s, the reestablishment of test packs of stone and other materials to look at long-term testing uh, to see how the weather is an important part of understanding materials. And I think you start to see this thread of potential from learning from landmark buildings that we should be able to take this information that we learned in dealing with landmarks and learn more about the information of materials or systems or details in the new buildings we design. I think there are a lot of opportunities to see how buildings perform and apply that to our new structures. We can certainly start to raise some of these questions about building performance. And I'd like to equate uh, building performance perhaps to the practice of medicine, maybe geriatrics. Uh, the idea being that you want to provide a continuing life for your building. Recognize that we'll never be young, but to look at questions about what is causing this thing, what is causing this uh, crack in the stone, things that are iron anchors that are corroding and moving that uh, parapet off the building. Uh, are we dealing with solving problems that are symptoms, or are we solving the cause of the problem because we understand the symptom? I think we have to look at questions like spalling masonry. Is it a skin disease that's acne, or is it carcinoma? What is the real problem? And is there a solution, or is this part of the aging of the problem? Building is not going to fall down, but obviously it has some skin disease. And we have to be able to recognize that some materials have inherent vice that were poorly manufactured, poorly detailed, poorly in place. I mean, one of the materials, unfortunately, is terracotta. Here you can see the, the face blades are worn off. Uh, terracotta is a burned material. And as it is in moisture, it expands slightly. And so a lot of cases, if it's not been properly installed, it actually is expanding and cracking the edges of the adjacent blocks. So understanding how materials perform over time gives us an opportunity to talk about what are the inherent vices of materials like terracotta, some of the sandstone, certain rock have uh, inherent vices that we should be able to deal with on what is the mitigation, what are the for a cure, what is the prognosis uh, for the, the life of the materials. And sometimes we can learn from looking at mistakes. Uh, this happens to be a building in North Carolina Arsenal. Uh, it had a lot of, of failure of masonry uh, in, the, uh, in the cornice. Uh, a lot of different coatings have been put on the building. Uh, continue of failure to the point that uh, over the doorway, uh, the facilities engineer built shelter so that people are in our building would not be hit by the tree. And it's interesting that nobody really looked at the cause. They were treating the symptoms. But one day, a brainstorming session where they really did call in the maintenance people and said, you know, what is happening? And one of the maintenance people said, well, you know, ever since we got that cherry picker, we were able to put salt in the gutters to melt the ice. And so, then building the gutters, uh, as all building others they leak, uh, salt's coming into the material. This should have been really a symptom of the process. But the efflorescence is not the problem, it's the subfluorescence, where that crystallization occurred below the surface of the stone, expanded and started popping off the, uh, the surface of the stone. No surface treatment is going to solve that. And so looking at what the problem was, what was the causes, and then you can start looking at the solutions. Get the salt out of it, you this or that deal with it better, better, better. Don't get salt in the gutters again. Are the kinds of things that you can start talking about the prognosis or the treatment uh, for this uh, problem. And I think that we need to, as buildings, uh, look at problems critically and not be jumping to the conclusion. This Basically, opening means a flat arch. But if you really follow this problem, you have a crack, a rather significant crack that opens all the way to the ground. 
And the problem here is a foundation problem. If you look at the timing of water and the staining at the bottom of this uh, ball and a water problem in the basement, the owner actually had been prepared to do this sometime, they never looked up. Like they were like all in the middle of up, so it's like 50 seconds. And so we need to be able to look from up to down and from down to up to understand what is the cause of this problem? What are, what's causing these staining or missing parts uh, and be able to treat the, the problem and not the symptom? I think that uh, we need to think of buildings as a whole ecology, that they are systems that are working together. Uh, a building is a six-sided cube that's fixed in the ground. Uh, we need to be able to think about how those systems work. And again, there are six parts of a building. We need to think of them not as individual parts, which we have a tendency to do, but interrelated parts. Uh, there certainly is the site, the landscape, the environments. That has a lot to do with what happens uh, on this building. There's the envelope, the walls, the windows, the, the roof. The envelope is the pretty face. The envelope is where the architectural details are. There's a structure. You see the bones of the building. It's holding the building up, whether it's close to beam or arches or, or domes or, or trusses. Uh, the, the structure is interrelated. In fact, part of the envelope may in fact be a barrier wall, but it's part of the structure. We need to be able to look at the interior as the soul of the building, the reason the building was built in the enclosed space. It has characteristics of an interior subdivision, interior decoration, interior furnishings. And one of the most difficult things is you put people and their stuff in the building, which will all some indicate a bigger expectations. And so we have this layering of envelope on a site with a landscape, with an environment that has a structure, that has uh, an interior, that has people that have stuff, and most importantly, an infrastructure. This is the veins and the artery and the heart. And very often, old buildings are attempted to be torn down because their mechanical systems don't work, or their elevators don't work, or some other nonsense. Uh, yes, these are critical parts of making a building work. But these are parts that need to be perhaps updated. These are probably not candidates uh, for a preservation. They need to be made uh, to work, meet the expectation of the people and their stuff. And of course, acting on this building are the forces of deterioration and some interesting pieces in terms of looking at the intrinsic and the extrinsic forces that are acting on the building or in the building. But we'll boil that down to a couple of principal parts. All buildings want to fall down. The force of gravity is on them. And so a building has to be able to resist the force of gravity, whether it's vertical or horizontal, as one might get in a hurricane or an earthquake, or the weight of snow, or just plain getting tired. Uh, the building reacts to uh, gravity. There are the natural forces of deterioration, and they go broadly into three categories. Physical, mechanical movement, creating stress, causing breaking apart of the elements at a macro or micro scale. Chemical reaction, whether it's we can lactation or efflorescence, and biological uh, action, whether it's trees or mosses and algae, and I have to remember that uh, mosses and uh, algae are the way that uh, sand is made from mountains. So you have these biological forces aggravated by water and thermal action. And it may be natural, it may be sudden, as in a natural disaster, you have a downpour of water, perhaps in the building of a or you have uh, for a force of a, a tornado, or maybe gradual, the actions of time 
Uh, and these mechanical, chemical, and biological activities are all aggravated by water. But the other thing that we need to be able to think about is what people do or don't do in their building. By some miracle, they have to go home and uh, cut out these joists and put in uh, a uh, soil pipe, but this building is still standing. So the, abuse, the human abuse of buildings is certainly a problem. But on all these situations, we have water in terms of wet water, in terms of liquid water, uh, in terms of water vapor, humidity, uh, moving through buildings under thermal pressure, uh, and ice. So uh, water, whether it's liquid, solid, or gas, is a problem that we need to deal with as our we catalog the forces of deterioration. Now, I think in my experience with the Statue of Liberty, there are five basic questions that we need to ask if we're going to be scientific and analytical about the way we approach buildings. And certainly, an opportunity to get up close and look at the Statue of Liberty is very revealing. There have been a lot of hanging off on scaffolding uh, uh, chairs, uh, looking at binoculars, but being able to build a scaffold around that uh, and uh, being able to get up close and, and look at our hickeys, uh, recognize that uh, we have uh, basically active, but if it has some other uh, problem, you can see the British pop uh, on the saddle here. Brecky knows, finds that she uh, needs a nose job, and actually this piece of copper is because the Statue of Liberty is made up of pure copper, about the thickness of its 50 centuries. A very remarkable structure. Uh, just as the side of biological or biographical point, uh, this is John I. Uh, Robbins is now the director of the Natchitoches uh, Training and Preservation Center in Louisiana Park Service facility. He was the Park Service architect on the site for that entire project. One of the reasons that this design build uh, exercise that had high visibility in the VR program was actually with the foundation it turned out to be a very successful project. We asked five questions. And I think these are important to think about because they apply all the way. Not just the Statue of Liberty. What is working? The Statue of Liberty had a remarkable structure system designed by ICO. And I think that the question one has to ask is it's working. It's over 100 years old. Uh, there's some old technology there, but it's working. And I think there's a tendency, particularly people want to demolish buildings and say they're old and they're sick. But nobody's saying they've been standing up for 100 years, something's working. Maybe the roof is a little flexible and, and theoretically doesn't be code, but it has been supporting loads for a hundred years, and perhaps we should be able to say it is working. We need to be able to say what is limiting, and certainly one of the major factors in looking at the use of such liberty is to keep the people up into the ground without those uh, serious windows is the size of the folk. We can only get a few people through that area at a time, and only 28 people into this platform. So you could put in high-speed elevators, which was considered, but you still have that limited factor. So understanding what is the characteristic of your building, whether it's the floor plan or the stairways, the egress, or what are the limiting factors become an important part of the question. So what is working, what is limited? The next question to ask is, what is changing? Everything is changing, but you want to know what is changing and how fast. We go back to the discussion about track uh, monitoring. The aspect of being able to measure the rate of change. The Statue of Liberty's skin is only as thick as a 50 centimeters, but the rate of deterioration is occurred over the beam. Some of it will still be there in 500 years. The idea is of putting a coating on there that will last 20 years, two months. The protective coating here is the green oxide, copper oxide, that's on that monitoring the rate of change over time. You start to say within the next 100 or 200 years, the major is a problem. But the treatment here is not going to be able to say the rate of change is acceptable. 
Then you want to talk about what is the problem, what are the symptoms, what do we, is it really going to deal with? And here we had a problem where uh, an iron armature that supports the uh, skirt, much like a breastplate model. Uh, interesting, the Eiffel's mother was breastplate. And this thin copper sheeting is hung on an iron armature that was then supported on the structural armature. He knew there was a chemical problem of that colosis between wrought iron and copper. He tried to deal with that in terms of armoring uh, this joint with asbestos. And asbestos fabric was a new miracle material of the 1880s, uh, soaked in uh, uh, slack and varnish. That disappeared. So corrosion occurred when uh, metal corrosion occurred in expands. Uh, you have what's called oxide jacking, and in fact, pulled those uh, rivets out. What is the problem? The problem is find a way to support the skin with a material that would be compatible. Uh, a lot of discussion was talked about what is the fix. A copper bar would be too heavy, too big. Uh, an iron bar. Uh, it's out of the question. Well, iron is out of the question. It didn't work once so when I do it again. It's a hard material to get. So the solution was to get a stainless steel that had a very close electrolytic relationship with copper, uh, one that was malleable so it should be formed. And the over 1800 armature bars that supported the skin were removed one by one and custom shaped on a new material. That was the case. And so I think that this question is that we can say with everything's got to do with can be in fact applied to buildings, ordinary buildings. This is a tax act project, uh, a hotel long abandoned uh, in Richmond that uh, had a 1960 motel uh, front put on it. Uh, and the question of looking at this building and saying, uh, what well, is working? A lot was working. In fact, much of the marble, or excuse me, limestone uh, pyroasters were under the uh, big slabs of uh, cast concrete. Uh, the spangles, which is made up of an interesting pattern of uh, terracotta cast into concrete, was there. Uh, we placed the pyroaster back there in the The rest of the building was working. It was old, it was dirty. People have, not, have learned not to like it but it turned into a very viable uh, senior living center, uh, affordable housing uh, project, and uh, were able to uh, preserve and rehabilitate that building because it was working. And figure out what we need to do to make it work. What are the limitations? Stairways are a great example of limitations. Open stairways particularly, they created stairways. How do you deal with code? How do you deal with limiting access? These are really problems that can be solved. In fact, a number of people work with codes or consultants to be able to work with an architect and an owner to work through the process of codes and regulations such as handicap access so you can preserve these character-defining elements of the building, deal with their limitations, and solve that problem in other ways. So understanding the limiting factors as a design challenge and not a no-go. I think are an important part of the way to think about that. We need to again develop testing and monitoring so we know what is happening and how what is the rate. This back runs through several floors, but it is not a structural floor at all. It's a problem of the building's breathing in terms of stepping its own expansion uh, fraction. And again, being able to read out that data and realize that these changes occur primarily when there's change of temperature during the day. So again, what is happening and how fast is that a uh, problem? Developing tests and monitoring. The monitoring may go on for a long time, maybe forever, to determine you know, at what point does a change become critical. Being able to see what is happening, uh, are we dealing with skin disease that can be stabilized? Are we dealing with deterioration that isn't going to get better. This is a classic example of another inherent by sandstone. And they start to fall out there. There's no reasonable way 
to stop that small. One really needs to be able to talk about substitute materials. In this particular case, the fix was to move the sandstone and replace it with a cast concrete artificial stone that had the architectural characteristics and colors of the original, but better performance standards. So I think that the lessons we learned from the Statue of Liberty as a monument we can apply to our buildings. And we need to be able to find out ways that we can think about these five questions to ask before we jump to the conclusions of how we, we treat our buildings. That we need to think of these in terms of our analytical considerations. So learning from historic buildings uh, as we apply it to existing buildings, tax act projects, or to new construction, I think is something where we can do some rigor for our discipline of design, presentation of materials, doing things that are buildable and that are maintainable, and then have an understanding of performance. I think we have a, a number of products on the market now that have inherent bias, EIS system, uh, exterior uh, insulation, the uh, one way for bricks to, to uh, steel stud from the mine has problems that have inherent problems, and yet they're being really used in construction. Uh, we shouldn't follow that path. We should be able to recognize that the opportunities to deal with existing buildings are jobs. I project that we're going to be looking at the increase of properties on the National Register within the next 10 to 15 years is growing from 70,000 uh, uh, listings with over a million uh, properties to something in the neighborhood of uh, two times that. So we're going to have an increased universe with a lot of job opportunities. I think with the passage of the uh, recognition of these buildings becoming 50 years old. We're going to have an increased universe of some very good buildings that were built in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. That again, are opportunities for rehabilitation, for continuing life and life in well-built buildings, important buildings in our architectural areas and in our place. I think that with the passing of the Homeowners Tax Act that I think will come into Congress here, hopefully will be passed, we're going to be dealing not with thousands of projects as tax act, but probably tens of thousands. Some of these will be small terrace houses that will be tax act by individual homeowners, uh, and some of them will be larger buildings that will have preservation uh, activity in terms of people providing uh, consulting fairly forms for tax act uh, review and architects of preparing projects. I think you're going to see privately owned mansions and townhouses that come into this universal work. And I think that we have an opportunity to look at our new public buildings, some of them icons of the day, that are going to need care, some significant care because of the way they're designed to uh, So we look at courthouses and county offices and uh, schools uh, university buildings, there's a great universe. And so it seems to me that when we talk about, about architecture conservation, it has really moved beyond just fragments to a mindset. And a remarkable opportunity for us as preservation professionals to participate in this concept of preserving as conservation, to keep our good buildings up and make them usable. Uh, make them have economic advantages to their owners and to make a major contribution uh, to the economic vitality of the town and the city neighborhood. And this is how I think that uh, architectural conservation has clearly come of age. Uh, over 21, it's a young adult, there's lots of opportunity for all of us to enjoy uh, the uh, fruits of architectural practice in, in conservation. Hopefully, other architects will recognize that just the also of the work. Thank you.